start. So I want to welcome everybody. Good evening. I'm Debbie Goldich. I'm the president of Women's League. And very quickly, I would like to introduce Rabbi Ellen Wollensfields. You want to give a shake? There you go. Um, Rabbi Ellen is our executive director, and she's here with us tonight. And we want to thank Dr. Mindy Steinholz for being chair of Health and Wellness Initiative and bringing us wonderful programs. So I'm going to turn it right over to you, Mindy. Thank you, Debbie. Um, and she took some of my lines right out of my introduction, so I don't have to say them. And I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, before I begin, I would like to thank the pro programming chair from Women's League, Grace Schessler, for providing me with an introduction to the Alzheimer's Association, which helped set tonight's program in motion. Um, and you should know there are many terrific Women's League programs available to our members whether you're a member of an affiliate sisterhood, a women's league group, or have joined as an individual member. You can check out this week in women's league to see all the upcoming programming. Um, there is how to live forever. There is women's league reads, lots of things coming up. One particular highlight will be on November 4th, personal conversations chaired by Vivian Lieber creating your new community without a partner. And I just have to give a shout out for that because my rabbi, Rabbi Dana Bogatz is one of the speakers on that night and that's on November 4th. So that is one of the ones you can sign up for. Tonight's speaker is Elizabeth Robles of the Alzheimer's Association. And she and her colleague Taryn are here with us tonight. And our topic is understanding Alzheimer's disease and dementia, which is a timely topic because most of us have been touched in some way by these illnesses, or we know people who have. So let me just tell you a little bit about Elizabeth. She's been working with the Alzheimer's Association for the last four years as the community education manager for the Long Island chapter. And more recently, her role has changed to program manager for the Long Island, Rochester and Finger Lakes chapters. She has her master's in educational psychology from Fordham University and is a certified dementia practitioner. Her passion for educating everyone about Alzheimer's and dementia and the resources available to them lies in her personal journey with her husband's grandmother who passed away from the disease in 2020 and her grandmother who was diagnosed two years ago. So Elizabeth is gonna to talk to us tonight about Alzheimer's disease, how it's not a normal part of aging. We're going to to learn the impact of Alzheimer's and the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia stages, risk factors, some current research and treatment for symptoms, and resources from the Alzheimer's Association. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much, Mindy, for the invite. I am going to share my screen and hopefully everyone can see my screen. Can I just get a thumbs up? We're good. Fabulous. Thank you so much. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for this uh, presentation that's going to give you a really top level look at Alzheimer's and dementia and hopefully give you a really broad understanding of what the two are because a lot of the times we hear these two terms used interchangeably. So hopefully we can help you have a good understanding if you don't already about what the two are. And you'll see me looking, I'm working off of two screens tonight. So I have my presentation on one and then my camera on another. So our learning objectives for tonight's program, we're gonna compare Alzheimer's and dementia so we give you that really good understanding of the two. We're gonna help you recognize how Alzheimer's disease affects the brain and list some of the risk factors of Alzheimer's disease. And, and we'll focus on um, a couple of those that we know are some higher populations that are affected by these disease. And we'll talk about some of those factors and, and studies and all of those good things that are going on with what we're finding out. And then we'll talk about the three stages of the disease. And when we talk about the three stages, at the Alzheimer's Association, we recognize the early, middle, and late stage. And in the medical context, that is called mild, moderate, or severe. So if you ever hear your doctor say mild, moderate, or severe, it is the same for us early, middle, and late stage. We will then move on to discuss the current FDA-approved treatments that can address some of the symptoms of the disease. 
then we will hear from some of our leading scientists in the field who are going to talk to us about advancing research and where we are with research currently. And then we will wrap up the night with talking about some available resources to the association. So before we get into the program, just a little bit, if you uh, like a little bit of house cleaning, I should really say. Any questions, please feel free to type those into the chat. Taryn will do her best to answer any of those that she thinks are appropriate to answer in the moment. Anything else she might say for me at the end of the chat. I will be asking for responses in the chat. This is an interactive program. There is some little quizzes throughout it. So uh, feel free to type in your response. All right, so our first module for tonight we're going to be looking at the impact of Alzheimer's disease. And just so you know, you know, Alzheimer's is a global crisis, and you are likely hearing of this disease more and more. So we were just talking about that as everybody was joining, right? So more and more people are being diagnosed with this. And it's probably affecting your personal lives right now. And maybe you've even heard more of it on the news, right? So Let's start off first with doing a little bit of a test your knowledge and see what you know so far. So I'm going to ask that you type into the chat your response for these upcoming questions. So your first question, approximately how many Americans are currently living with Alzheimer's? Do you think it is over 3 million, more than 6 million, about 8 million, about 11 million? Which do you think is the correct answer? All right, I saw a lot, a couple of eights, I saw some six, over eight. All right, so I'm gonna go with majority. Thankfully, we are not at 8 million just yet. So currently, there are more than 6 million people that are living with this disease in the United States. Um, this year was the first year that we actually hit 6 million prior to we were in the 5 million range. So we are expecting that this year, and I'm not this year, but 2022, we will see another increase in that bump, especially because of um, COVID and some of that, uh, you know, factor of not being able to socially interact in person with some people. So we might see a little bit of a bump with that one. So thank you for participating with that first Q&A answer. Our next one that I'll need some participation for, about how many Americans do you think provide unpaid care for people who are living with Alzheimer's or other dementia? So remember, there's 6 million who are living with this disease. Now, how many do you think are caregiving for those 6 million? Right, so I'm seeing a couple of 11. I saw some 14. So 14 is not the right answer. Oh, 11 is winning. All right, so yes, there are over 11 million Americans that are providing unpaid care for their loved ones who are living. So when we talk about unpaid care, we're talking about family members, friends who are not receiving any money for this disease, even children, right? So children are even now providing some of that care because their grandparents are moving back into their homes and their parents are relying on them for some of that assistance with helping them out just to make sure that they're able to still continue with some of their home responsibilities. So we talked about this 6 million number and you know that number is going to continue to increase and that's if we don't find a cure for this disease, right? So that will continue to increase if we don't find something to stop this disease right in its track. And it's projected that in the year 2050 that 15 million Americans are going to be living with this disease if we don't find a cure. So there is a huge rush right now with research to really figure out a way to stop this from happening. And to give you an idea, there are over 15, not 15, 50 million Americans, um, or I should say individuals, right, who are living with this disease in the world. So I'm going to play a video with some other facts and figures. And then, you know, if you could just put into the chat anything that really pops out or stands for you, something that shocks you that you weren't aware of.
thank you, Linda. So Linda chatted in the cost of care, right? So the cost of care, that's going to continue to increase. And if we continue on that track, that will bankrupt our system, right? It's projected that we can reach that 1.1 trillion mark if we don't find that disease. So, you know, a lot of research taking place currently. Yes, thank you. Kills more than breast cancer, right? And um, combined, right, with that colon cancer. So, Yes, a lot of interesting things that people end up finding out from seeing our programs. Thank you both for chatting in your responses. So let's take a deeper look at Alzheimer's and dementia so that this way you have a clear understanding of the two. So of course, we are gonna test your knowledge. There's not too many more of these. All right, so true or false, a little bit easier. Alzheimer's is a normal part of the aging process. I see Debbie already. <laughs> Absolutely, right? Everybody knows this is false. It is not a normal part of the aging process. We know that this is a disease that's causing issues with the, the brain's ability to retain information, to be able to recall that information, right? So it's causing issues with the person's memory, their thinking, and their behavior. And this is all happening because, and we'll talk about this as we go through the program, the disease is starting to kill some of the brain cells. And as those brain cells start to die off, it's, it's much more difficult for the, pe the person who's living with this disease to be able to recall that information or to be able to connect with what is the next word they might want to say to you or the event or the subject that they're trying to recall. Our next question, another true or false? People younger than age 65 can have Alzheimer's disease. Very good. So yes, that is a true statement, although it is much less common. Um, people younger than age 65 can develop this disease. Typically, most people are diagnosed with younger onset Alzheimer's anywhere between the ages of 40 and 60. However, there have been cases where people have been diagnosed as early as their 30s with this disease. Um, so it is a possibility. And, you know, typically there's those three genes. Um, there's three genes that are associated with that younger onset Alzheimer's. So great job, everybody, who getting those true or false questions correct. So we are going to hear from our first expert in the field, just uh, talking to us about Alzheimer's disease. Dementia is the umbrella term for an individual's changes in memory, thinking, or reasoning. There are many possible causes of dementia, and Alzheimer's is the most common cause. Other causes of dementia are vascular dementia, which is marked by changes in the blood flow and the blood vessels in the brain. Dementia with Lewy bodies, identified by specific brain changes throughout the brain that include the buildup of a protein known as alpha-synuclein. And frontal temporal dementia, which is marked by brain cell loss in the front sections of the brain or the frontal lobe. Each type of dementia may have distinct characteristics to cause specific behaviors in the individual. But there is also some overlap in behaviors among the types of dementia. So, you know, again, really great illustration. I love the umbrella illustration because it helps people to understand that there are many different types of dementias out there. And the reason that we hear Alzheimer's uh, so often is because it is the leading cause of dementia out there. There's, you know, anywhere from 60 to 80% of the individuals that have a diagnosis of dementia are living with Alzheimer's dementia. So we're going to hear from a caregiver and she's going to talk to us about the importance of making sure that we get an accurate diagnosis. Certainly having the diagnosis of Lewy body was helpful in our planning because we began to understand where this was coming from in the brain. Uh, where otherwise we would not have known. Uh, like we knew something was happening, but what was it? To give it a label actually helped, although it was a big umbrella. Uh, you know, it explains some of the characteristics and symptoms that we were experiencing and seeing. So to recap our Alzheimer's and dementia, section, again, 
dementia is that general term for a collection of symptoms that we are seeing with our loved ones or even with ourselves that is severe enough to really interfere with your daily living activities. And Alzheimer's is that most common cause of dementia. Remember, it's accounting for about 60 to 80% of the cases that we're currently seeing in the United States. And we know that this is not a normal part of aging. Alzheimer's is a progressive disease. So let's take a look at, at Alzheimer's in the brain. And as we discussed before, you know, Alzheimer's is a disease. And when we think about our brain, it's our most complex organ. And it only weighs about three pounds, right? But yet it's our most powerful one. So we are going to hear from one of our leading experts in the field, just talk to us about Alzheimer's disease. More than a hundred years ago, Dr. Alice Alzheimer's described specific changes in the brain what we call the formation of plaques and tangles. Now Alzheimer's is a progressive brain disease that's marked by these key changes and is thought to impact memory, thinking, and behavior. The brain has three main parts, the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. Each one plays a role in how the body functions. The cerebrum fills up most of your skull. It is part of the brain most involved in remembering problem solving, thinking, and even feelings. There are about 100 billion nerve cells or neurons throughout the brain that transmit messages in order for us to create memories, feelings, and thoughts. Alzheimer's disease causes uh, nerve cells to die, which leads to the brain tissue loss, or what we call shrinkage, and causes loss of function and communication between cells. These changes can cause the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease such as memory loss, problems with thinking, planning, behavioral issues, and even at the end stages, problems with swallowing. So to recap our section on Alzheimer's in the brain, it was only about 100 years ago that we finally had a name for this disease that many were seeing but just didn't know what it was. And Dr. Alois Alzheimer's was the person who made that uh, discovery because he saw that there was the formation of plaques and tangles in the brain. An interesting fact, when he made that discovery, it was with a woman who was living with younger onset Alzheimer's. And we know that what happens with Alzheimer's is that it causes the nerve cells to die and it leads to that shrinkage that Dr. Hartley was talking about. And as a result of that, like I had mentioned earlier, that's where we start to see those changes with our loved one's ability to uh, recall certain things and then also issues with thinking and as the disease progresses with behavior as well. So we are going to move on to discuss the risk factors. And, you know, unfortunately, everyone with a brain is at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will develop this disease. There are certain risk factors that do increase a person's risk of developing this disease. And we're going to talk about that in this next section. All right, one more test your knowledge here. Your, so your question is, what is the greatest known risk factor for Alzheimer's disease? Do you think it's genetics, family history, or age? I'm getting a lot of genetics here. Family history too. All right, I think the winner here is genetics. So it's not correct. The greatest known risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is age. And this is a little bit of a trick question. Uh, these are all risk factors really when we look about it, right? But we're looking for the greatest known risk factor. And when someone asks the greatest known risk factor of Alzheimer's is age. And your risk of developing Alzheimer's starts about the age of 65, unfortunately. And that's retirement age for most of us, right? And the unfortunate thing is that as we continue to age, you know, our risk continues to increase, right? So 
here, I always like to point out this little factor that they have here on the PowerPoint, 32% of people age 85 and older are living with Alzheimer's disease, right? So you can see that every five years, your risk increases. And then by the time that we're 85, about 32% of that population is living with the disease. So thank you to those that participated. I do want to stop here because I did see two questions. I don't want to lose them in the chat. Um, and I'm going to try to find them really quickly. We, we will still have enough time. I just, so Beth's question, uh, is it true that Alzheimer's is only diagnosable after death? Not so anymore, right? They are able to, with a high certainty, tell you that this is definitely what you're living with. Again, this is all made possible with the advancement of research. So great question, Beth. Then there was another question with Alzheimer's. I just want to scroll up. Elizabeth, the question um, is, how is Alzheimer's a cause of death? I can understand it as a, it as a secondary cause, but I would think ather, atherosclerosis or digestive disorders, for example. That, that was pretty good, Taryn, the way you were able to pronounce that, because <laughs> I don't th I think I would have botched that, to be honest. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, so, so yes, it's not... <laughs> people don't necessarily die from the disease, right? There's a lot of times that you're gonna die from other things like the flu or, you know, my husband's uh, grandmother passed away from COVID. She didn't pass from the disease, right? Unfortunately, she, re she received it from her caretaker who was taking care of her in the house when all of this happened with COVID at the beginning, right? So other things, so if someone living with Alzheimer's might not necessarily die from Alzheimer's. There might be other things that they're gonna pass from. However, if they do die from Alzheimer's disease, it's because what ends up happening as you progress into the late stage is that you lose your ability to sustain your life. You lose the ability to uh, wanna eat or swallow those basic human instincts of wanting to survive. They're no longer able to recall that because of the brain cells dying off. So if someone does die, it's because of that reason with the disease. But really uh, the majority of the people that do pass away, like I said, it's other illnesses or you know that are causing them to pass like flu or other illnesses, uh, infections and so forth. Both great questions, thank you for those. All right, so let's go on to hear from our expert in the field. Alzheimer's disease is marked by specific brain changes that result in the clinical changes in individual experiences. That is, changes in memory, thinking, or reasoning. And ultimately, Alzheimer's is fatal. The exact cause for these changes is unknown, but there are some hints as to what may contribute to an individual's risk. Age is the greatest known risk factor for Alzheimer's. And when we look at populations of people, we see an increased risk over the age of 65. However, Alzheimer's is not normal aging. Family history is also a known risk factor. Research has shown that those who have a parent or a sibling with Alzheimer's are more likely to develop the disease. And that risk increases if more than one family member has Alzheimer's. When we talk about the genes involved in Alzheimer's, there are two categories that could potentially be involved risk genes and deterministic genes. Risk genes increases an individual's risk for developing the disease, but does not guarantee that they will develop Alzheimer's. Deterministic genes, which are rare for Alzheimer's, guarantee that the person will develop the disease. So in addition to what Dr. Hartley was discussing with the risk genes and deterministic genes, we do know that there are certain populations that at are at a higher risk of developing this disease. Hispanics are one of them. They are 1.5 times more likely than whites to develop Alzheimer's and other dementias. And then African-Americans are twice as likely to develop the disease as whites. And we believe that this is because there are higher rates of vascular disease in these two populations. And um, these, these vascular disease rates are going to put them at a much higher risk for developing this disease. And you will also see that at the very last bullet point, women are also another population at a higher risk where almost two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's are women. And it's estimated that there are 3.8 million American women that are living with this disease today. And we know and we've thought for a long time that it had to do with the fact that we live longer than men, uh, but we don't think that's necessarily true. 
anymore. So now scientists are looking into the genetic difference and makeup between men and women to see what that might be contributing to women getting, you know, this higher risk factor for developing this disease. So much more to come. Researchers are looking at that currently, and uh, hopefully we'll have some input into why, you know, we as women are at a much higher risk than men are. So to recap our risk factor, again, the greatest known risk factor is age, right? So that risk for developing the disease will increase after the age of 65 and then five years after that. And family history is also a known risk factor, right? So having a parent or a sibling with the disease will increase an individual's risk, right? Um, and risk genes and deterministic genes are the two genes that Dr. Schneider spoke about. And these are just two different genes that are associated with Alzheimer's. Typically, your deterministic genes are those that are going to be assist, uh, associated with more of that younger onset Alzheimer's. And we know there are those risk factors or those higher populations that are at much higher risk of developing those diseases as we discussed, Hispanics, African Americans, and also women. So Mindy, great question about women at a higher risk worldwide. Uh, I know there is uh, global research going on and I believe the women's study is a global research effort. I can get back to you with that answer. So our next module, we're gonna talk about the stages of Alzheimer's. And it's really important to know that no two individuals are going to experience the symptoms or the progression with this disease in the same way, right? So we're going to hear from one of our leading experts in the field. So this first video I'm going to play for you is one of our leading experts in the field. After I play that video, I'm going to play the four tiles that are listed here on the side of the slides. And the four tiles are actually people who are living with the disease in the early stage. And they're going to talk about what some of the symptoms are that they experience. So let's hear from our expert first. One of the things that impacts our brain is all the other things that can happen to us as we age. And we know that Alzheimer's, the most common risk factor for getting Alzheimer's disease is age. But we also have lots of other things that go wrong with us as we age. And so how those other health factors impact our brain can also impact how Alzheimer's presents in other people. It's a different kind of forgetting. It really, really is. It's not just forgetting where I put my car keys. It's much deeper than that. And uh, for example, I cannot read a book. I used to be a voracious reader because by the time I turn a page, I have forgotten what I had read. And if you're reading a novel, you have to know what transpired before in order for you to continue to read on. And so I don't, I can't read a novel. So I, I've even stopped trying. Math, I, I can't do a simple tip anymore. You know, I. I sit there, I stare at it. Um, it's crazy what numbers I can't deal with anymore. Um, and in some ways, that's the, that's the disease to me. Uh, the other thing that I've increasingly been struggling with are words, um, which I have dealt with words my entire life, you know, as an avid reader, as a reporter, as a writer. Um, I, I struggle with them now. I think the thing that surprises me the most about my dementia is that um, it, it is progressive. And, um, and I'm finding that I'm forgetting more. And uh, they do memory tests for me all the time at the doctor. And um, so that, that becomes a little disconcerting at times um, to see my cognitive impairment continue to decline. Um, but 
again, I, I really have hope. Um, I don't live really in the future. I can't live in the future. I can't worry about what the future is going to bring. Um, I have to live to, for today. So again, in these videos, the four individuals that we heard from are living in the early stage. And what will happen as this disease progresses is that their symptoms are going to worsen over time and they will progress at, you know, but they're going to progress at different rates, right? Because this disease looks different for everyone. And typically when someone is diagnosed with this disease, they can live anywhere from four to eight years after diagnosis. However, there are some individuals that do live up to 20 years after receiving a diagnosis. So it just really goes to show you how very individual this is for everyone. Even those four individuals that we heard from all presented their symptoms very differently. Um, you know, again, if at the Alzheimer's Association, a couple of my colleagues and I always say, you know, if you met one person with the disease, you've really only met one person with the disease because it really looks different for a lot of people. So we are going to hear from one of our other leading experts in the field. Alzheimer's affects everyone differently. As a result, it's difficult to place a person in a specific stage of the disease. However, there are three general stages that are commonly referred to as early, middle, and late stage Alzheimer's. In a medical context, you may hear these stages referred to as mild, moderate, and severe. In the early stage of Alzheimer's, an individual may be able to function independently. However, they may start noticing more frequent memory lapses. Friends and family may also begin to notice difficulties in the person and a healthcare provider may be able to detect problems in memory or concentration by conducting a detailed medical interview. Middle stage Alzheimer's is typically the longest stage and can last for many years. Damage to the brain cells can make it difficult to express thoughts and perform routine tasks, and this can lead to increased feelings of frustration and anger. In the final stage of the disease, an individual loses the ability to hold a conversation, control their movements, or respond to the environment around them. Cognitive skills, that is their memory, thinking, and reasoning skills, continue to decline. And this can lead to personality changes and need for round-the-clock care. So this is really just to give you an idea of how someone will progress throughout the three stages. We sometimes cannot neatly place someone in one stage versus another stage. There's a lot of blending sometimes, but it just really goes to show you that as this disease progresses, the increase on the caregiver and their responsibilities, right? And the requirement of having to do more for their loved one. So we like to point out that this will give you an idea of possibly where your loved one is, but sometimes we cannot neatly place them in one stage versus another stage. So to recap the stages of Alzheimer's disease, again, like we heard Dr. Schneider said, there are those three stages, early, middle, and late in the medical context, mild, moderate, and severe. Again, I can't stress more enough. I think I stressed it a couple of times. No, it's two individuals are going to really experience the symptoms and the progression of the Alzheimer's disease the same way. And symptoms are going to worsen over time and people are going to progress through the stages at different rates as their abilities to change. And, you know, we get questions a lot of time. Well, how long is my loved one in this stage? How long is my loved one in the middle stage? And we really can't say, again, that's the disease, right? It's going to progress as fast as it's going to progress or as slowly it's going to progress. So we can't neatly say that someone's going to be in one stage for this many years versus this stage for so many years. All right, so let's talk about some FDA approved treatments that are available to deal with some of the symptoms. But before we do, this is our last test your knowledge section. So again, if we can utilize that chat. Taryn, I know some questions are coming in through the chat. Um, if you could just keep track of me, I'm gonna answer them at the end. So your first question, 
True or false, current drugs help address symptoms but do not treat the underlying cause of the disease. Do you think that's true or false? All right, so majority went with true, right. So again, the key word here was symptoms, right? So the medications that are currently FDA approved are really only helping with symptoms and for a limited time, right? Because what's happening is um, they may help to uh, lessen or stabilize the symptoms for a certain time. But again, this disease is still progressing. It's not curing the underlying cause of what's causing Alzheimer's disease. So it is going to eventually progress. Okay, so let's hear from another expert in the field. There are currently several drugs that are FDA approved to treat the cognitive symptoms associated with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they treat the, the symptoms, but they don't treat the underlying cause. So eventually people will progress, but, um, but they do treat some of the symptoms and, and help people for a time. So the first class of drugs are col cholinesterase inhibitors. These drugs work to prevent the breakdown of acetylcholine, which is a chemical messenger found in the brain that's associated with learning and memory. There are three FDA-approved drugs that are, are in this class of drugs. There's Aricept, there's Exelon, and there's Razodyne. There's another class of drugs that uh, modulates glutamate, which is another chemical messenger in the brain that's associated with learning and memory. And this drug is called Namenda. And then there's a, a final class, which is actually a combination of cholinesterase inhibitors and glutamate modulator, and this is called Namzeric. So those are the three drug uh, categories that your physician, if your loved one is living with this disease, might prescribe to them. Um, and we'll talk about in the next slide, we'll see some of those generic names as we recap this section. Um, so those cholinesterase inhibitors, right, Aricep, um, Dinapazil, Exelon, and then you have the rest of the uh, generic, which most of our loved ones are, are sometimes given those generics, but they're still the same medication to deal with those symptoms. And typically, uh, the way the doctor will prescribe the medication is once they are told what the symptoms are that their loved one is experiencing or displaying, I should say, and then they'll start to prescribe based on some of those symptoms that the caregivers are describing they're seeing their loved one exhibit. Um, and again, you know, these treatments only address some of the symptoms um, for those that are living with Alzheimer's for a certain amount of time. Uh, they are not treating that underlying cause of what's causing this disease. We're not there yet, and we hope to be there soon. So our next module, we're going to talk about where we are with advancing um, Alzheimer's research. So we're gonna hear from our first researcher in the field. This is an incredibly exciting time in Alzheimer's and dementia research. The advancements that we've made in the last decade to understand the disease as a continuum, meaning that the biological changes are starting a decade or more before someone is experiencing the changes in the memory and thinking. This sets the stage for possible prevention. The idea that when we have the tools to identify those individuals at the earliest time point, and when we have the interventions, to target individuals at that earliest time point, we can intervene to stop or slow the progression of the disease before an individual loses their memories. I'm excited about what we're learning these days regarding lifestyle. One of those things that we've seen in the past as things like exercise and nutrition have now started to gain more momentum to indicate to us that it can change your ability to uh, slow cognitive decline that is really the first stages of Alzheimer's disease. This may include things of, like social engagement, mental um, uh, cognitive training. It can be things such as exercise. It can be nutrition. All those things are now starting to point that they will lower your risk for Alzheimer's disease. And I know there was a question that came into chat I saw earlier regarding some of those lifestyle habits that uh, we can adopt to lower our risk factors. And Dr. Hartley just mentioned those four, right? So our 
diet, our exercising, our stimulation of our brain, right? And that social engagement, those four are really powerful components that we need to maintain throughout the rest of our lives. And there's currently a huge research study going on right now in the United States with those four components to see, you know, what it's going to actually do in those that are between the ages of 60 and 70 and how it'll reduce their risk for this disease. A lot of hope does come from the, the Alzheimer's Association, all the research that is being done. Um, even though there is not a cure today for the disease, I know in my heart there is going to be a cure one day. And I know we're getting closer for that cure. Because even if you fail in a research study, you learn from that failure in the research study. Um, that failure always brings progression. It's nice to see the, the association um, spearheading in many ways the emphasis on getting the money at the federal level and at the private sector to get the research done so that someday there will be an effective treatment, hopefully cure, hopefully prevention. All right, so next we're gonna look at the importance of clinical studies, and we will then talk about trial match. So first, let's learn about clinical studies. It's more important than ever for people to participate in clinical studies. The fact is, right now, we don't have an effective treatment to stop Alzheimer's disease. And if we don't have people participating in clinical trials, we never will. And so participating in a clinical study is one way that everyone can get involved in a very direct way in the fight against Alzheimer's disease. And for people who currently have uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease, there are some additional benefits. You get access to uh, very close medical care. You also may be among the first people to have access to the treatments that will eventually prove to work. Sometimes you hear the phrase, it's a failed trial. That means that it didn't hit the end point, it didn't achieve an FDA approved drug. But I would say as a scientist, the only failed trial is one that doesn't give you valuable information. And if the trial is well designed, if it is a good scientific experiment, you get extremely valuable data so that you can plan the next trial and do the next study even better than the last one. And it gets you that much closer to that FDA approved drug, to that effective treatment, and maybe someday even a cure. So next we're gonna learn about a trial matching database service called Trial Match that can link you to clinical trials that are taking place throughout the United States. Currently, more than 5 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's. By participating in clinical research, you can move us toward methods of treatment and prevention for all those affected by this devastating disease. Alzheimer's Association Trial Match is a free clinical studies matching service for those with dementia, caregivers, and healthy volunteers. To start, simply create a confidential user profile and receive a list of studies that may be a match for you. Don't just hope for a cure, help us find one. So to recap our section, you know, we have, our scientists in the field have done tremendous work with really getting, you know, a good understanding of the disease, getting closer to really understanding, you know, what is going on with the brain, where we should be looking um, to try to find a cure for this disease. And we are getting closer, you know, there has been so much discovered over the past decade, um, you know, with research. And it's really critical that we continue to figure out more and to really get a better understanding of how to stop this disease from advancing. So that we are always looking for people who are healthy, uh, that wanna participate, 
caregivers and even people who are living with the disease in clinical trials that are taking place around you. I know I'm registered for clinical trials and I participated in a study two years ago it was a simple questionnaire form. You don't necessarily have to agree to the, to the clinical trial. You don't have to go in if you're not interested, um, but that is an option if you are interested in taking part. There are both drug and non-drug studies that are taking place. Like I mentioned before, my participation was a simple questionnaire. And if you're interested, that's the website right there, alz.org forward slash trial match. So now we are heading towards the end of the program and we are going to talk about all of the wonderful free resources that the Alzheimer's Association offers. So the map of the United States was lit up in purple because that is everywhere that we have services and chapters that are there to assist family members. Our mission at the Alzheimer's Association is to continue to lead the way to end Alzheimer's and all other dementia. And the way we're doing that is really by accelerating global uh, research and driving risk reduction for, you know, the world really, right? Because there is that global research going on, that global awareness that we're trying to uh, bring forward. And also to help those with understanding the importance of early detection and, you know, maximizing that quality care and support for both the person who is living with the disease and those that, um, you know, are caregivers for them, right? Because caregivers also need the support for themselves. And our vision at the Alzheimer's Association is to one day see the world without Alzheimer's and all our dementia. So the three greatest key resources that we have at the association, we have so many more though. Um, you know, the first one I always like to talk about is our 24 seven helpline. And our 24 seven helpline, the numbers listed there for you, 800-272-3900. It is a great resource. On the other end of the line are master level clinicians that are there to help you with maybe the simplest question you have about the disease, uh, you know, if you just need someone to talk to, or if you need to find resources near you, right? Like maybe a doctor who can help uh, possibly diagnose your loved one living with this disease. They can provide you with a list of all those resources near the zip code where you need those resources. So I'm gonna play a video of someone who's utilized the 24 seven helpline before. I've had a couple of phone calls that I've been able to make in to the call center. Um, when I've had a couple of quick questions that I wanted to ask, you know, there's been a couple of nights, two o'clock in the morning, you you have questions, you have anxieties, and I was struggling dealing with them, and it's amazing. It's it's it was one of the best things I ever did was keeping the uh, call center on my favorites now, just to know that there's somebody you can call who is aware of what you're going through. And, you know, the great thing about that is the helpline will also connect you with your local chapter if you request it, so that this way you can um, ask for care planning services, right? So there's certain times in our care journey with our loved one where we really need to map out our next steps when it comes to legal planning, when it comes to what does future care look like. So, you know, local chapter staff can help you with that as well as our helpline staff. And helpline staff can also help you find support groups that are near you. Um, a lot of our support groups are still virtual as well for those of you who are not uh, going back to in-person activities just yet. We also have our website, which is updated with information very frequently about what is going on with research, what we know about the disease, how to care for someone who's living with the disease, especially during COVID, during the holidays, some tips. So the Website is typically the first stop that most people on this caregiving journey is where they go. So let's hear from someone who's used our website before. When I went to the Alzheimer's Association website, which is alz.org, then I was trying to find out more about what was Alzheimer's? What really is this disease? What is younger onset Alzheimer's? What is dementia? Is there a cure? 
How long has this been around? How many people are affected by this? Where can I go for resources? Where can I go for help? What do I do with this? How can I handle this? Is there more people like me out there? Is there someone that I can talk to if I need to? And there I found the support line that's 24 hours a day. And there I found where I can go for workshops, where I can go and read things and postings that people have done, where I can find out what events is happening in the Alzheimer's Association, where I can see how it's affecting people around the globe. And then another great resource that we have is um, our community resource finder. So if you need resources near you, you can simply even go on to this website, alz.org forward slash CRF. And when you go to that website, you can look for education programs, support groups near you, um, elder care attorneys if you need one neurologists, psychologists, adult daycares, assisted livings, memory care units, all of those are listed there as well. Um, so let's hear from someone who's used that. Since I've been diagnosed with dementia, the one place that I know I can go to um, for assistance and help and support is to the Alzheimer's Association. There are people there that I know by name that I can contact if I'm having a difficult time or if I'm struggling to find some resource, that they will provide that to me. There are different ways to get involved with the Alzheimer's Association. If you are interested in getting involved with us, we are always looking for volunteers. We are, there's a, a whole list of in-person and virtual volunteer opportunities that you can, uh, you know, choose from at our website. So you can go to alz.org forward slash volunteer. If you are great with speaking to people like I'm doing tonight and educating, we are always looking for virtual educators. Or if your passion is to maybe facilitate a support group, we are always looking for support group facilitators as well. Another way that you can get involved is through advocacy. That's another volunteer option that we have if you're interested. And really those are people who are advocating on behalf of both caregivers and people living with this disease to make sure that our elected officials know the impact that it's causing on people who are caregiving and those living with the disease so that they still receive the much needed funding to be able to continue research, but also to be able to continue to get uh, care provided to them. And then we spoke about trial match tonight. Again, that's that clinical database uh, matching service that will match you to clinical, style, uh, clinical studies that are taking place near you. We have our Walk to End Alzheimer's, which is a huge fundraising event for our uh, research, right? So a huge majority of the funds go right back into Alzheimer's research. And we have over 600 walks throughout the United States taking place. Um, and it's a really nice support. You'll see some people are holding flowers in the background there. They each have their own significant meaning. Um, it's a really nice event if you haven't been to one. This year, we were back in person, but we also had that option for those that weren't comfortable to walk in their community wherever they were comfortable. Then another big fundraising event that helps to, you know, donate funds towards research is our longest day. And this is typically held during summer solstice, where people find different and unique ways to raise funds and awareness for Alzheimer's. If you're interested in that, you can go to alz.org forward slash the longest day or TLD. And, um, you know, we have a lot of interesting uh, ways that people raise funds for that. One year, someone did goat yoga. Um, and then we always have kids who, uh, you know, set up lemonade stands as well. So that is the end of our program. And I will be happy to answer those questions that I saw that came in through chat. So I know one of them that I saw uh, was just to relist those four components again with the healthy lifestyle. So researchers are looking into um, making sure that you're really stimulating your brain, right? That cognitive activity, making sure that you maintain a healthy lifestyle and the lifestyle they recommend or the diets, I'm sorry, they recommend 
with that. So again, stimulating your brain, the diet, right? So the diets are either the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet. And the DASH diet stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And those two diets through research have proven really effective for helping individuals uh, reduce their risk for this disease. And then with that, we need to exercise every day of our life, we need to get out there. You can have a rest day. It could be six days a week, but make sure that we are really exercising and getting that heart pumping and getting that blood going because the oxygen is really important for our brain. And then that last component that they're studying is the social component we really need to maintain social activities, that social connection with others. They don't know what it is about the social component, but they know that it's very important. So they are studying that as well. So I hope you were able to write down those four components. All right, and I know there was a lot of other questions. Um, a Canadian counterpart, I, yes, I, we do have, I, I think it's the, oh, I know they have society in their name, American uh, society maybe, I'm saying that wrong. I can, oh, yep, Alzheimer's, right? I see it there, somebody answered in the chat already, perfect. Um, all right, so I know there's some other questions. Uh, let's see. I wanna go back up. Okay, so what type of medical specialist usually makes a diagnosis of Alzheimer's? So that's a really great question. Um, it can be your general practitioner if they are very well versed in conducting cognitive assessments. So I always, you know, uh, tell people when they are looking for that diagnosis, you know, ask their primary physician, are they versed in, in conducting a cognitive assessment? And if they're not and you need that referral out for your uh, assessment, you know, then make sure that you're upfront about that. Any other specialist that can make that diagnosis is definitely a neurologist, a psychiatrist, a psychologist can make that as well, as well as a geriatrician if the person is over the age of 65. So there are different uh, specialists. And, you know, again, I think it's really important to ask the question if they have that experience with conducting cognitive assessments. All right, I'm going to keep going, Taryn. If I miss any, I'm trying to scroll through. I have a few anonymous questions for you as okay. well. So yeah, yep. just let me know. You want to ask me those? Because I'm, I'm trying to scroll. Yeah, I have the whole list for you. Oh, so perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so the, the first is, um, we'll, we'll take it from sort of the, the ones that came in first, and then we'll just make our way down. Um, the first is, excuse me, why isn't there a humane way to allow someone with severe Alzheimer's to choose to choose to not use resources to keep their body alive. Wait, can you read that to me one more time? I, I don't think I caught that whole question. Of course. So the question is, why isn't there a humane way to allow someone with severe Alzheimer's to choose to not use resources to keep their body alive? I don't know about alive, so I don't, I don't, I don't think I can answer that. What I think I can talk about is the end of life experience, right? So we do really talk about using a more um, holistic method when we come to that point of life when someone is ready to pass on, and that really incorporates bringing in. Um, religion, bringing in music, bringing in sensory, right? So again, while keeping in mind the preferences, but I really, I can't speak to that, that preservation. I'm sorry, I, I don't know much about that. But I hope that answers somebody else's question with kind of what we look at with trying to um, talk about bringing in more of that holistic kind of uh, experience when it's time to have our loved one pass on. Absolutely. Uh, next question. When someone with dementia does not partake in conversation, is it because they do not want to seem like they do not want to show their deficiency or can they really not carry on part of the conversation? Is being quiet just a coping mechanism? Yeah, you know, it could be a, a number of things. Um, it, you know, it could definitely be that they are quiet because they're still trying to process what's going on, or they may be too 
much uh, stimulation in the environment. When I talk about stimulation, it can be the TV, a couple of people having conversation, and that's really hard for them to process. So what ends up happening with this, you know, disease or, or with dementia, right, is you know, it, it takes longer for them to really process as this progression goes on what we are trying to relate to them. So really breaking down the words, trying to understand what the words are, and now trying to formulate a response back. And what ends up happening as someone progresses with this disease into the middle stage, you will see that there's more of that withdrawal and, and not talking. And now communication takes form in the way of behavior. And we see more behavior incidents where, you know, we might see our loved one more upset. Um, we might see them anxious or confused, right? So it could be a number of things. It could be they don't want others to know that they're living with this disease, right? If it's very early on, or it's a processing issue, and they're just trying to process everything that's going on. Thank you. Next question. In second and third stages, does the person realize that they don't remember things? Can you engage in conversation with the person about the pain of the excuse me, can you engage in conversation with the person about the pain that the memory loss is giving them? Never know what to talk about. Yeah, so, you know, in the middle stage, we do think that they are able to understand what's going on and they are, um, you know, going through the emotions of realizing that they are losing more and more. And, and we see that in the early stage too. Um, and you can talk about it. I think that's good to talk about it because it helps them and it also helps you as the caregiver. We don't know much about the late stage. We don't know what they're able to retain. Um, if they're understanding what we're saying, there's they're still, you know, more research that's needed to really understand what they're able to understand from us in the late stage and, and uh, what they're processing at that point. It's just difficult because in the late stage, more of their language, it has disappeared at that point, right? And uh, we, they may have one or two words only. Next question, is psychiatric illness such as depression a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease? So there has been um, psychiatric illness that can be associated, depression can be, yes, those, those can be some risk that are contributing to this. But I think the key, Elizabeth, right here is that it can be, but it, because the disease is so specific and individual to each person, we can't exactly say for sure, like there's no one formula, there's no kind of checklist or things to, to check off as indicators or, or red flags that would be applicable to everyone. I think really that's... Yeah, and I think the best um, thing to keep in mind is if you're concerned, your doctor is going to be the best person to help you through this, right? Because they're, they're the expert in the field. They know you maybe for so many years. They have a good baseline um, of where you were versus now. Now and they can really assess for that. So if you, if anyone here who's joining us tonight, if you have any concerns with memory, whether for yourself or, or your loved one, you know, the, the doctor is going to be the best person to be able to help you with that. And Elizabeth, I think that's, that's perfect timing because we, we, we did have a couple of questions around exactly what you're saying. So things like I've always had a, a terrible memory. How do I differentiate this from dementia? How is forgetting different or the same as Alzheimer's? I think that speaks to what you just spoke about. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the next one is uh, my grandmother, both of her daughters, including my mother and my aunt have Alzheimer's disease. Are there doctors that can test me to determine if I will also develop Alzheimer's? It was very frustrating as a caregiver to watch the decline, even with medication. Yes, there, you can absolutely, absolutely get genetic testing. However, I highly, highly recommend that if you want to go the genetic testing route, that you do link up with a genetic counselor. You need someone to speak to. It, it's, there's a lot of emotions that go behind genetic counseling. Um, I mean, sorry, genetic testing, um, you know, from going to even go get the tests, opening those results. So it's really important that if you do want to go 
and get genetically test to see if you are carrying that bio that marker right um, that you get a genetic counselor and if you call our helpline they'll be able to give you a number for a genetic counselor near you okay, thanks elizabeth we have two more questions um, so the, this one is, are there medical studies being done to get at the underlying causes to dissolve plaques, for example? So there's a number of research studies, uh, just to give you an idea, there's over 500 research studies going on. And I think, um, you know, a, a couple of them are looking at uh, the aria in the brain, right? And they are trying to figure out what is that first initial change. So they are even studying people in their early 30s to see what starts to happen to the brain as it changes so that they can get a better understanding. There are way too many research studies for me to keep up. 500 is, is a lot. If you are interested in research, there is the Alzheimer's Association has an app that you can download to your smartphone. It's called Alzheimer's Association Science Hub. HUB. And there they have a list of all of their research studies, what's been going on with the research studies, and then also um, send out, you know, updates and announcements, as well as our website. But I feel for the research end, the Alzheimer's Association Science Hub app is like probably the best way to keep up with the latest research going on in the association. And I feel like this might be part of the answer to this final question. Um, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more question after this one. One just, just came in at the last minute. Um, some symptoms seem similar to sensory perception disorder. Is there a connection? I don't know. I really don't know. That would be a good question for um, your doctor probably. Okay, and, and, um, and this, one, this one is similar again, I think talking about science and research. I have so many questions about possible research projects regarding women being a higher percentage of Alzheimer's patients and victims. I'm aware of hair dye statistical studies, multiple joint replacements. Is there an opportunity to forward them after this excellent, excellent session? Is a topic as I described addressed on the website? So that would be on the app, the science, um, science hub app. Uh, that would be where you would find what's going on uh, with most of the research right now, in particular to women and so forth, any other genre that you're interested in. I'm just going to plug that link in for us. Thank you, I Taryn. Think, <laughs> I don't believe at this point there are any more questions that I can see in the chat. All right. Perfect. All right, so there's, we got all the questions, I hope. If not, Mindy knows where to find me. I can get you those answers. <laughs> So, so we want to thank uh, Elizabeth and Taryn from the Alzheimer's Association for giving us such a, a in-depth presentation. And um, before we close, uh, Rabbi Ellen um, Wollens-Fields, our Executive Director of Women's League, would like to close us out with a prayer. I don't know about all of you, but this was a really heavy time. So I knew that um, Alden Salovey had a prayer. So I have made it to be more neutral. Alzheimer's diagnosis. In stages, we're told that in stages, our loved one will lose words, memories, ability to care for oneself, connection to family, connection to oneself. God of compassion, stand with us in the days, months, and years ahead. We're frightened, angry, sad, confused, defiant. Insert whatever feeling and emotion you have. Grant us time to remain mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally present for our family, our friends, for ourselves. Grant healing power to treatments to keep this disease at bay. Give the physicians knowledge and insight, caregivers skill and perseverance and patience. Grant scientists and researchers tools and understanding to develop new treatments speedily in our day. Ancient one, we need your care, your consolation, and your loving hand. 
the God of old, you are our rock and our redeemer. El kol hazmanim ata tsuri vigoli. Love to all. Thank you, that was beautiful. We wanna thank Elizabeth and Taryn again for being here. I wanna thank Debbie for being our tech support. Uh, in addition to all the other wonderful things she does as our international president. And uh, I wanna wish everybody a good night. Night. Good night. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, for Elizabeth. Wonderful Thank you. program. Wonderful program. Thank you, Mindy.